Aloha kako Awinola. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, live streaming Fridays at 3 p.m. Hawaiian Standard Time. My guest this week is the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Kingdom of Hawaii. Recent escalation of irresponsible and radically aggressive behavior by North Korea is a call to action. Foreign Affairs Minister Leon Siu has been very busy mobilizing peace efforts in response. Anoa'i, Minister Siu, and uh, welcome back to Hawaii as my Aloha, Maika'i. Good to be here. So, uh, what's up? What have you, what have you been doing? Well, uh, lots <laughs> of things. I've been in, in Geneva quite a bit, as well as New York. Uh, both places are headquarters for the UN. In, in Geneva, it's the Human Rights Council and other human rights bodies, as well as the World Trade Organization, the World Intellectual Properties Organization, and the uh, World Health Organization. Um, and, and in New York, of course, are the more political bodies, the Security Council, as well as, well as the General Assembly. So in all of those places, we are, as the Hawaiian Kingdom, are trying to assert our, uh, uh, at least be able to explain to them uh, the situation that we're in um, because of the United States occupation, but even more so the great danger that we've been put into because of the United States occupation, uh, particularly the militarization of Hawaii. So uh, the response to this recent aggression by uh, North Korea, what is the Hawaiian Kingdom's uh, take on this? Our, our take is, of course, is that there has to be a peaceful settlement or peaceful uh, agreement on both parts, uh, both sides, to, to put aside any kinds of talk of, of armed conflict, because armed conflict these days means nuclear war. Uh, particularly with nuclear powers. Um, and so the idea is that what we're trying to promote at the United Nations, as well as hopefully directly with the United States and with North Korea, to communicate that we, the Hawaiians, uh, pose no threat or danger to them, and uh, that we have to be able to negotiate some kind of a settlement uh, for the safety and security of our people, and that it can't be just, well, it should be for the immediate danger that we're facing, but also there needs to be a long-range plan to defuse any kind of possibility of uh, warfare on our soil. So let's have the, let's have the map. We mm -hmm. have a, a couple of great visuals. I've, uh, this is from the UK's Daily News. Uh-huh. Of course, yes. So in this map, of course, you see the Hawaiian Islands, very small islands. But we happen to be, uh, along with the Aleutian Islands, the westernmost outpost of, quote, the United States. Um, and therefore, we become targets. And particularly since there is a large military presence of the United States in Hawaii, we are targets not only to, to uh, Korea, North Korea, but to China and to Russia. Uh, we are the easily, easiestly accessible or reachable targets that they have, next to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. But uh, anyway, so again, the huge military presence here puts us in grave danger of actually nuclear annihilation, because we're not talking about just a nuclear bomb that goes off, like in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was bad enough. Now, I mean, the smallest nuclear bombs, like 10 times, 20 times, 30 times the size of what happened in Nagasaki. So the um, the um, peace efforts. How? Uh, what are? Do we have some concrete actions, events? Uh, well, what is the scope of the, the there's discussions? There's of course quite a bit of, of discussion going on at the Security Council as well as the United Nations, uh, and it, it they're they're doing the best they can, but the the. Uh, the focus is on trying to get North Korea to back down and not to be so belligerent about their, uh, their threats. Um, but what we're trying to do, of course, is to insert this whole thing that everything must be settled in a peaceful manner and that, that our lives are at stake uh, and, and we're not uh, the combatants in this case uh, or, or the, you know, the people in the dispute. We ac actually are an innocent bystander and uh, the only reason that we're being targeted, of course, is because of the United States presence. So have you been able to communicate with any of the North Koreans about? Uh... Uh, not directly. It, it's a little bit awkward right now. But we are, of course, trying to. Um, the communication with the North Koreans 
is, uh, as particularly at this time, in, in years past, there has been some, some mild communications. But uh, right now, it's just everything's too hot. Um, and, and everything is uh, suspect as far as any kind of communication. So we have to be circumspect in how we do that. So we need to go through uh, intermediary countries like Switzerland and Sweden, uh, who both have uh, uh, embassies in North Korea and, and do have, are able to act as uh, in-betweens. So speaking of, of Switzerland, um, mm -hmm. you, uh, you've been pretty active there. Um, Tell us a little about what's what's been happening in Switzerland. We have a oh, okay. we have a photo of, of a panel that you were on. Yes, um, uh, th that was a panel that I was on with um, uh, several people from Alaska. There, the three people to the right are from Alaska, and the s person in the center is from India, uh, and she's a long time, uh, very highly respected uh, UN UN uh, representative. Um, and the person to her immediate right, the person who's next to me, is uh, Dr. Alfred Desaius, who's uh, the, the United Nations Independent Expert for the Promotion of a Democratic and Equitable International Order, which wow. is a very long title, but wow. his, his position is actually quite impressive. Uh, and his position is that he can uh, and is called upon to look critically at the United Nations uh, well, to look at the United Nations and then criticize the, the things that need to be improved, as well as to or to commend them on the things that are they're doing right. Um, and so his report actually ca carries quite a bit of weight. So he does an annual report, uh, and in that annual report, he has uh, twice mentioned uh, the situations of Alaska and Hawaii, uh, particularly. Uh, well, actually, he's mentioned the situation of West Papua and Rapa Nui, uh, Maluku and uh, the Mapuche, the Kashmiri, and all around. Basically, these are countries that would should qualify to be uh, in the uh, uh, in the program for the United Nations for decolonization. Hawaii doesn't actually fit that program, but but what he's saying is that these are countries that are out there that kind of fell into the cracks after the whole decolonization process. Uh, the delisting, the so-called. Right, okay. right. Yeah. So there was a list that was created in 1946 of countries that were still colonies of other countries, so like Great Britain, France, etc., all still had colonies. And uh, so, so everyone submitted the names of these countries, and all of Africa, for instance, were, were, was colonized. And so the, those names were submitted, and then now all of Africa are, are free. There's 51 countries um, in Africa that are now independent nations. Now there's still a lot of conflict and things going Certainly. on, but the thing is they are independent. Uh, so uh, of the 80 or so uh, countries that were listed in 1946, only 16 were left on the list as of uh, 2013. And in 2013, French Polynesia, Tahiti, was added back onto the list because uh, it had been sort of surreptitiously removed by France. Uh, so, but it was put back onto the list. And that, what that did was it sort of triggered uh, a response from the other nations, particularly those that had been decolonized in the last uh, 40 years, and saying, well, you know what, we're not through with this decolonization process yet. So uh, Dr. Desaius took the opportunity to remind them that not only are there 16 or 17 uh, on the list, but there are all these other countries like Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, and so he actually reported that to the United Nations General Assembly uh, with the idea that they should pay attention to these other countries. They should receive communications from countries like Hawaii and Alaska and the Mapuche and West Papua, et cetera, um, to uh, consider being uh, going through a self-determination process under decolonization. So, uh, what um, is is there anything happening here locally that people here well, can, might be able to? Well, actually, yes. What's going on locally is the assertion that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists is a very, very strong argument that falls into line with what we're trying to say at the United Nations. Now, like I said, Hawaii is, is, a very, is a different situation than, say, Alaska. Alaska was never a, an organized, Unite. Unified. organized yeah, nation, nation, right, or, or organized country. 
And so they need to go through a decolonization process, meaning there needs to be a, a period of time in which the people can study and consider all the different options they have for self-government in the future and make a decision. So the decolonization process is simply saying the people have the right to self-determination, that they, but they need to be informed and they need to make a clear choice. Free formed. Free, uh, prior and informed consent. consent yes. yes. That's so for Hawaii, we, we're in a different situation. Right, because we already were an organized, sovereign nation recognized by all the other nations. In fact, um, it can be argued that we, we still have uh, treaty relationships with 173 of the 193 nations of the United Nations. Because colonial uh, treaties under, colo under a colonial um, uh, situation, uh, those treaties actually transfer to the colonial country that becomes decolonized. So, say, all of Africa, for instance, still ha uh, has, by the fact that the uh, Hawaiian Kingdom had treaties with their administrative powers or their colonial powers, so now that they're free, we, we still have a treaty, an implied treaty with them. Okay, so that's kind of our official um, situation. And right. there, there's more happening local, I feel. Um, I'm a little. Uh, right. Right. Yes. The, right. the Na'ia Puni uh, movement um, mm -hmm. has brought um, sort of a, a new wedge um, in within the community, and mm -hmm. um, w w there's a the effort to take that uh, constitution that was um, created last year by mm -hmm. the unelected now mm -hmm. Na'ia Puni candidates and put that forth, and bring us under the. Um, back under the wing of the United States uh, in this capacity. In a as diminished a, capacity. In a diminished capacity, mm -hmm. in a very diminished capacity, right. extinguishing many rights in right. the process. So what, what, are, what is your um, approach to that? Well, of course, so what is being offered by the United States is, is just as you described, this federal recognition of the tribal nation. Um, which is actually inadequate in, in the light of the fact that our situation, the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States, is actually an international uh, level of, um, of, of law. So, um, so what we're saying is that no matter what they decide under domestic law, it does not apply to the fact that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists and the Hawaiian Kingdom has a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Now that's something that I, I saw that the Na'ia Puni and others have hijacked that term, nation-to-nation. -nation. Actually what they're talking about is a nation within a nation, you know, a subservient nation within a nation, but they're using the term nation-to-nation -nation, which is very misleading. Thank you, Minister Sue. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be wrapping up for a little break uh -huh. for a minute and then we'll come back and explore this and the peacemaking efforts a little further. All right. Aloha. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. You could talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. That's Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas, and with me today is the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Kingdom of Hawaii. Minister Aloha. Siu, yes, we're back. So we were we were talking about some of your activities, and um, mm -hmm. there's other places that you've been very active. Uh, Fiji, for instance, we right. have uh, you've been uh, interfacing on that political level. Yes. Uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is actually the head of the foreign affairs um, uh, a part of the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, and usually the foreign affairs has, uh, like the Secretary of State, has ambassadors under them and all of that. 
We don't have that uh, capacity at this point. We have a few representatives out there, but not to the extent that Hawaii used to. You know, we used to have 90 diplomatic legations all over the world. Uh, so we were one of the most heavily represented foreign powers in the world, uh, or foreign actors. We weren't necessarily a power. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so actually, so when our, although our concentration is toward the United Nations, because that's where the concentration of countries are, that's where they gather. So we're not necessarily trying to be a part of the United Nations. We're actually trying to get access to the foreign dip, the diplomatic, the diplomats that are in these areas where they congregate. So one of the other pl places that there are regional conferences or congregations as well. Uh, there's the um, in the OIC, the uh, OIC. Uh, Organization of uh, Islamic uh, Cooperation. There's the African Union. Both of them have over 50 members. And then there's the Pacific Islands Forum, which has, I think, 15 or 16 members. And then there is the Melanesian Spearhead Group, which has five members. Um, and these are all regional organizations, international organizations. There are several uh, also in South America. Um, so what I try to do is to contact them and go and talk with them as well. So I've been to the South Pacific a number of times to different conferences of either the Melanesian Spearhead Group or the Pacific Islands Development uh, Forum and things like that. So I was in Fiji a number of, well, three years ago um, at the Pacific Islands Development Forum. And uh, there's a photo, I don't know if that photo is up with me. and. Um, the prime, oh, this is actually this is a funny story. The prime minister, uh, I, who was, I was talking to just a few minutes earlier, um, his name is uh, Baina Marama, and uh, he and I were talking. And then he said, I need to go say hello to somebody across the room. So he goes across the room. Then a couple of minutes later, I see him motioning to me to join him. So I go over there and he introduces me to this woman. And, and so he says to her, uh, oh, he says to me, he said, uh, may I introduce to you the ambassador of the United States to Fiji? And then he says to her, may I introduce to you the, the foreign minister of the Hawaiian Kingdom? Oh! <laughs> and, and he kind of stood back and, and wa tried to, to watch the reaction. <laughs> and what was well, it? I, I, she's a great diplomat. Uh, there was hardly uh, anything. Uh, she, she thought very quickly on her feet and just basically was gracious, said, pleased to meet you. And I was able to chat with her a little bit and presented her with some of our uh, brochures and materials and then just talked to her and said we'd be talking about this uh, later. Then I ran into her again a couple of times at other um, international events. So anyway, so the, that's what I'm trying to do is, is to actually make uh, a presence or show up at these various meetings and, um, and just, just to talk story with some of these people and to remind them of our situation. And so but they are very much aware of our situation. Now, uh, being aware and being able to do something are two different things. And, and even being, being uh, sympathetic and doing something are two different things. And there's, it's quite complex because of the way world politics work. But uh, one of the things that occurred two years ago, and this was in Geneva, uh, was that um, uh, the uh, Pakistan actually took a cue from Alfred Desaias, the independent expert, and he, they asked a question while the United States was on, a, was on the stand and on a review. Um, they, they asked a question about uh, Hawaii and Alaska and shouldn't they be considered under international law rather than, say, the domestic law of federal recognition. And, and that kind of threw a wrench into the works for the United States because it was a very awkward question to try to answer. And when they did answer, their, their response was that we're taking care of it through our domestic uh, federal recognition uh, scheme. <laughs> and that did not go well with most of the other countries who were there because they all recognized uh, the fact that this is a, a, an ineffect or a, a invalid. invalid way to approach an international question yeah. about the sovereignty hmm. of, of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Oh, and so what that did, what that one single very innocuous question by Pakistan did, was it opened up uh, the doorway. I mean, basically they broke the ice on the question of the international standing of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And so from then on, we've been really enjoying being able to talk much more freely 
from an international from standpoint of international law. Okay, so when you when you've attended these events and so forth, um, is there are you reporting to who are you reporting to and who tells you? Uh, Minister Siu, it's now time for you to go here well, we, and there. We have a cabinet council of the wine kingdom here, so I report to them. And I also put out a newsletter to people who are interested. And uh, just, I can't divulge as uh, too much, uh, mainly because it's sensitive. And, and <laughs> as you can see with all of the controversy going on in the U.S. right now, you know, if you speak to somebody, uh, somebody says, well, they've been talking, and what does that mean? Right. You know, and, but all kinds of conclusions okay. or misinterpretations can be drawn. And so, so we don't speak that much about what's going on behind, in, behind the scenes. But things like Pakistan asking a question or, uh, or attending these different uh, international meetings, uh, that's, that's pretty much obvious. We can, we can say something about that. But as far as discussions that are going on uh, behind the scenes, that, that's still sensitive. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I apologize. No, 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 no that's all right. <laughs> so, Minister Siu, mm -hmm. in this, in, with regard to North Korea, let's circle yes. back a little bit. Um, you, what is the plan, if you are allowed to mm -hmm. um, talk about it, mm -hmm. f for the nation of Hawaii's response, the kingdom of Hawaii, sorry? Okay, uh, there, there's two levels of this. One is the immediate danger, which we would like to diffuse by um, finding a way to communicate with North Korea that, um, that we are in grave danger and that we, we are not the enemy, um, but at the same time understanding that Korea considers the United States the enemy and the United States is here. But basically to try to defuse the immediate situation to maybe get some kind of concession to say, okay, we'll hold off for a little while or something like that. We're not quite sure. Um, but uh, the idea is to start some kind of a dialogue about differentiating between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States and the state of Hawaii. Um, with the idea that we would work even more fervently for the United States to um, withdraw from, from Hawaii. Um, of course, that's another problem, but again, we're, we, that's what our goal was in the first place, is to work toward the withdrawal of the United States. Um, and again, to try to do it without animosity and without any kind of rancor. Yeah, peacefully. Uh, to do it peacefully and, and to come to an agreement that this is best for both of us. Um, so that's the tricky part. But it, it's doable. And, and the real, I, I keep, keep on going back to it, the real um, uh, factor in this is the people of Hawaii. Uh, to be able to, to simply uh, rise up and say, this is our country and we have the right to determine our own future and the right to whether or not we're going to harbor military uh, weapons of mass destruction here and things like that. That should be our decision. And, uh, and so we, we need our people to rise up and, and to, to assert that. You know, I, I, I think it was in the, in the late 80s, I um, had been living in Germany and, and read German well enough to, um, when there, there was an article that came out in the Stern uh, magazine and it, it showed where on earth um, nuclear weapons were. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked. There, smack on Hawaii, there was uh, the little symbol for nuclear. I had no idea. I thought, isn't well, that interesting that I need to find out from German news source mm -hmm. that, you know, we actually have nuclear weapons right. here in Hawaii. And they deny, the United States denies it. But it's, it's, all, it's only reasonable to assume that we do. Uh, and, and I, I understand it's been confirmed, but, uh, but uh, I mean, we've got the biggest fleet in the Pacific, one of the biggest fleets in the world uh, stationed here with, sub, with nuclear submarines. And, <laughs> and wait a minute, so they have to have weapons nearby. <laughs> they wouldn't be stored necessarily in Guam. So it's got to be on, on board or, and or in storage facilities here on land. And as we well know, through the events of the Second World War, mm -hmm. that, that certainly makes us a target. That's right. And yeah. you know, the 75th anniversary of the Second World War, uh, you know, again, it was a very meaningful thing because it, again, Hawaii was attacked, but that was a specific attack over on Pearl Harbor and Wheeler Air Force Base and Schofield. 
and very targeted. You know, there's very little collateral damage around. Uh -huh. Mr. Sioux, uh, mm -hmm. we have two minutes left. Okay. But I hear you went to the the funeral of Fidel Castro in Cuba. Yes. Please yes. tell me what that was right. like. Right. Well, that was part of the relationship that we've been building with various countries in South America. So um, I went to that. Uh, I was invited and went uh, to Cuba. It was actually quite uh, a massive thing because uh, there were a lot of people at the funeral. And the funeral was held actually not in Havana, but in, uh, in the city where Castro was from, which was about 800 miles away, it was wow. some distance away. And, uh, but anyway, it was, it was huge and it was massive and the whole Cuba was, of course, basically shut down during the whole time. It's, uh, it was a national time of mourning. Um, and so, but what I was there not only to participate in that, basically to honor uh, the Cubans and, and their efforts and their uh, ability to survive through all kinds of hardships, um, but also to strike up uh, a more direct contact with their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, mm -hmm. and were you able to do that? Yes. Wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. I uh, went to Cuba in 2013 ah. for an international permaculture convergence and was really moved mm -hmm. um, by uh, the people there and their, their long, long, long struggles. Mm -hmm. So when we come back to Hawaii, uh, we can reflect that there's, there is hope. Yes. There is yes. hope. And, and of course, that has given us a term that, that uh, we can use, and that's normalize. We, the Hawaiian Kingdom, wants to normalize our relationship with the United States. I think, Minister Siu, that's an mm -hmm. excellent place to say mahalo, and I look forward to your next report. Thank you so much. Aloha.